Hi everyone, welcome to our first online lecture. So this is how I'm going to run the lectures, is I will be actually recording my screen. Um, so I can use the pointer and the, the laser that are with PowerPoint and everything. Um, and then I'll upload onto YouTube. So I'll upload everything on YouTube specifically so that you'll have access for the rest of the quarter. Um, Canvas only allows a certain amount of storage space, so I wouldn't be able to put all the videos. And um, I want to utilize the uh, closed captioning on YouTube. So YouTube does a really great job of automatically um, typing up the captions of what I'm saying. So hopefully that'll be helpful if you don't have um, the headphones or a speaker. So we are officially online. So this is um, Geology One Online. First time that I have run a lab course online, so we're going to see how it goes, but I'm pretty excited about what we're going to be able to do. Um, if you have not watched the introductory video that I emailed out on Sunday, please watch it. That is, um, it's pretty short, it's like 10, 12 minutes maybe, um, just going over how we're going to run the class. So um, I had to do a little bit of changing on Canvas and reorganizing so that things are easier to find and to make sure that you all know exactly um, where to find the different components, where it's uh, the homework, the lecture, the video, the um, lab. So everything has been uh, sort of revamped on Canvas. So if you haven't watched that intro video yet, um, go ahead and watch that to see how we're going to organize the rest of class. So this is um, week 10, part one. It's about reading maps. It's relatively quick. Um, we're not doing too much in this portion. It's our very first online lesson. So I wanna make sure everything is under control before we get into um, anything too long. So the lab's a little short. Um, and this lecture is definitely shorter than um, all the other ones are going to be. <laughs> so don't get used to them being this short. But as always, um, post questions in the discussion board or um, send me an email or a message on Canvas if you have any questions. So we're going to talk about reading maps. We're going to go over um, reading maps using coordinates and then also understanding uh, solar time. So to start with, um, every map has uh, every map should have um, a legend a scale bar, and an orientation arrow. So that's how you can figure out where you are and really what you're looking at. So the legend is going to be, like down here, um, what the symbols on your map actually mean. So here's our campus. Um, here are the symbols. This is the legend. Here, this uh, map of Southern California. Uh, I think it's Orange County. Um, the legend is smaller down here. So the legend tells you what the symbols on the map actually mean because they aren't always uh, self-explanatory. The orientation on the map is going to be your compass. So it's going to tell you uh, which way is north, east, south, and west. So most of the time, especially on larger scale maps, north will be oriented up on a map. However, something smaller and zoomed in, like for example, our campus, it tells us that north is actually in this direction um, on our map. So located in this direction, this way is north. So that is really good to know. You should always understand the orientation, what you're looking at, what you're reading. And then the other thing is the scale bar. So we've worked um, a little bit with the scale um, scale bars in class before, and then next week when we get into topographic maps, we're going to look at them even more, but I'll just introduce the different types. Um, there's really three different types. You can either have a written out statement, a ratio, or a scale bar, which I know um, the scale bars you're very familiar with because we've used them in labs before. So a written statement would say, um, generally it's going to write out the ratio or the fraction, but in words. So it might say one centimeter equals 10,000 meters, like in actual words, instead of um, showing a scale bar. A ratio is something like this one here, where it says one is equal to 100,000. 
So with the ratio or a fraction, sometimes it'll be written one and then the um, diagonal line to symbolize fraction. Um, one is to 100,000. So what this means is that one of whatever you measure on your map scales up to 100,000 of that unit in real life. So if you measure in inches and you measure one inch on your map, that distance is equal to 100,000 inches in real life. If you measure uh, one foot, that is equal to 100,000 feet. So it scales up in that ratio. So that's kind of nice because you don't have to worry about um, units. I mean, you do have to know which unit you're using, of course, but that can be um, really straightforward once you know how to think about it. And then the scale bar or the scale line, that is what I know we've used multiple times in class already, where you have the actual line on the bottom of your map that shows you, okay, this distance from zero to one is equivalent to one kilometer in this case. So when we're measuring distances on a map, there's two ways to do it. So you can think about a straight line distance, which is what they say um, as the crow flies. So the straight line, the shortest possible path between these two points would just be a straight line. You wouldn't take a path that zigzags all the way around. No, the straightest line, the shortest path is going to be a straight line. So this can be pretty easy to determine the distance because we can use a ruler. This is what I know we've done in class. You can use a ruler, and the ruler you can then bring to the scale, which would be hopefully down at the bottom of this map, um, and determine the distance on the ground between those two points. So this one's straightforward. I know that we have practiced this before. Um, the other thing to think about when we're measuring distances is what if we're not measuring a straight line? What if it is... Um, we're measuring around, along a route or along a path that isn't a straight line. So instead of measuring from A to B here, we're actually measuring the distance of this curved line. So the distance if this is a river or this is a trail or something like that. We want to know the actual distance, not the straight line distance. There's a couple ways to do it. Um, one would be to break your root up into small pieces. So you can see that's what's over here. So the blue is what you're trying to measure. So if you use the red line and you break up um, the blue line into multiple pieces, so you create sort of pivot points. And then what you'll do is you'll add up the distances of all of these little points, uh, excuse me, all of these little segments. So you can take each of these segments and line it up to the um, scale bar and measure each segment and then add up the total. So you'll see here, the more line segments that you have, the more accurate you're going to be. It'll take longer because you'll have to do um, more measurements, but the more accurately you can actually capture the path of the blue line if you have more line segments. So to be even more accurate, um, instead of doing straight line segments, you can actually use a string. So you can take a piece of string or yarn um, and line it up along this blue line. So you can lay your string down on your uh, surface and then measure or mark how long or how much of the string is required to cover that uh, wavy surface, that path or that root. And then you can measure the distance of that string. So you can use the string to then uh, measure how long that distance is. So instead of a ruler, you'll measure um, the length of the string. So you'll measure how much string was required to cover this path. So we're not going to do this, that part in our lab um, because I don't have any string to give you because we are not in lab together, but I wanted to go over the two different cases because sometimes people don't um, even think about having to measure a route that is not a perfect straight line. So when we are mapping on our globe, which is a three-dimensional sphere, we rely on latitude and longitude. So Latitude and longitude will make up the coordinates of your location. So coordinates are always represented rep represented 
as latitude and then longitude. So you're going to report latitude, comma, longitude. Always latitude comes first for consistency, honestly. Um, latitude is the distance from the equator. So our equator is the line of latitude at zero degrees. And then uh, latitude ranges from zero to 90 degrees north and from zero to 90 degrees south. So latitude will always be between zero and 90. Just depends on if you are north or south of the equator. So when you're reporting your latitude, you're reporting your distance from the equator. Longitude is the opposite. So longitude, you're reporting your distance from the prime meridian. So the prime meridian is uh, a line of longitude that runs through Greenwich, England. This was set in the 1880s, I believe, because there was a um, large lab there. So we still use the same, uh, the same system of longitude where zero, our prime meridian, goes through um, Greenwich, England, which would be somewhere in here. So when we report longitude, we report our distance from this prime meridian. So we are either east of the prime meridian between 0 and 180 degrees, which would be on this side of the globe, or we are west of the prime meridian. So you can go from 0 all the way to 180 degrees west of the prime meridian. So when we report a point or a location, we would say our distance from the equator, our latitude, and then our distance from the equator, uh, excuse me, our distance from the prime meridian, our longitude. And you'll be able to determine exactly where that point is. So some important features um, that you might be familiar with on the map, we have the, uh, the tropics. So the tropics are between um, 23 and a half north and south. We have our equator is at zero degrees, of course. And then the Tropic of Capricorn and the Tropic of Cancer outline what we call uh, the tropics. We also have our uh, circles, so the Arctic Circle and the Antarctic Circle at 66.5 uh, north and south. And then our prime meridian. So you'll see the prime meridian runs north to south here. Uh, and it runs straight through Greenwich, England. So again, anything to the west is going to be the Western Hemisphere. Anything to the east will be the Eastern Hemisphere. Our equator denotes or separates our Northern Hemisphere to the north from our Southern Hemisphere to the south. So when we're um, writing our coordinates, we report coordinates in degrees. So degrees of that 360 degrees circle of our globe. So we know our globe is 360 degrees. Uh, we report in degrees. And in each degree, there are 60 minutes. In each minute, there are 60 seconds. So it's similar to time. The way we break it down is really similar to um, how we think about time. So each degree is broken into minutes and the minutes are broken into seconds. So when you want to be more specific than just degree, you'll report in minutes and seconds. So for example, Saddleback um, College, this is actually very specifically our classroom. I used Google Earth to find our specific coordinates. Um, I'm already missing our classroom, as you can tell. Uh, we'd be located at 33 degrees, 33 minutes, and 10.49 seconds. Oops, I forgot the second symbol. This uh, double quote should be there. And so that is uh, degrees north, because we are in the northern hemisphere. We're north of the equator. Um, and 117 degrees, 39 minutes, and 50.51 seconds west, because we are located west of the prime meridian. So we are about 33 and a half degrees north of the equator, because this uh, 33 minutes is about half of a degree, um, and then almost 118, uh, yeah, 118 degrees west of the prime meridian. So you might sometimes see, instead of degrees west, you'll see a negative degrees east. Um, it's the same thing as saying degrees west. It, that is just done because if you think of a um, the coordinate system on a graph, technically west is the negative. 
So sometimes you'll see a negative degrees east, and that just means um, degrees west. So when you're using a globe or a map to actually locate a point, the first thing you want to do is find your latitude. So think, okay, is your point north or south of the equator? And then you can find that latitude. So let's say the coordinate we've been given is 30 degrees latitude. So we know that the point that we're talking about is going to be somewhere along this 30 degree line, 30 degrees north. If it was 30 degrees south, we know it would be somewhere around here. So if it's 30 degrees north, okay, now we know it's going to be on this circle somewhere. Now we find where this 30 degrees north latitude intersects with the reported longitude. So if we're 30 degrees north, which is this line, and we are uh, zero, we could say zero degrees, that means we're going to be right on our prime meridian. So if we were east of our prime meridian, we would be somewhere over here. If we were west of our prime meridian, we would be somewhere over here. So you want to find where the two coordinates intersect, and that's exactly the point that's being reported. So you'll find uh, where you're located in terms of latitude, and then where that intersects with the reported longitude. So when you're looking at a flat map, um, I've been showing a lot of globe examples. Uh, you're not seeing the entire globe, of course, but hopefully your map will have a scale so you know what you're looking at. Um, you will also notice that the latitude and the longitude are going to be reported. You'll see these uh, lines across, the latitude lines and the longitude lines, and the values will be reported on the top and the bottom and then the sides of your map. So here you have your latitude values. This is the 30 degrees north line, the 40 degrees north line, and then here you have your longitude. So 100 degrees west of the prime meridian, 90 degrees west of the prime meridian. So if you were um, located at 40 degrees north and 110 degrees west, you would find your 40 degrees north line. Okay, you're going to be somewhere on this line. And 110 degrees west, so you find where those two lines intersect, and you'd be in um, Utah there. So where that... 40 degrees north and 110 degrees west intersect. That is how you locate yourself using coordinates and a map. You'll have to do that um, a couple of times in lab. So next, I quickly want to talk about solar noon and how we use solar noon um, to think about distance and time. So solar noon, it's also sometimes called local noon. This is the time where the sun is at the highest point in the sky over your head. So when the sun is directly at the highest point in the sky, wherever you are, that is considered solar noon. So it is not always at what we call noon, like 12 o'clock. And that's because our time zones are rather large. And our time zones are, have really abrupt changes. So if you were located in the perfect center of your time zone, then maybe you would have your solar noon being precisely at noon. Um, whereas if you're uh, more towards the east or the west edge of your time zone, um, your solar noon will be offset a little bit from noon itself. So if you're in the eastern part of your time zone, your solar noon will actually occur before your clock says noon. So if you're on the eastern time zone, uh, remember the sun moves this way in our sky, uh, the apparent motion, I should say, of our sun. <laughs> so uh, the people on the eastern part of your time zone will see the sun first. That means the eastern part of the time zone will have an earlier solar noon. So your solar noon might will, be, uh, will occur actually before the clock strikes 12. And then if you're on the western part of your time zone, I'm using this Chicago time zone as an example. Um, if you're on the western part of your time zone, your solar noon will actually be after the clock strikes 12. So after actual noon. It might just be a few minutes. Um, it's not anything hugely drastic. But because our time zones are broken up into these pieces, 
Uh, we know that solar noon is not always perfectly at 12 o'clock noon. Um, so if you're standing to the east of the noon meridian, which means the noon meridian, uh, you are offset to the east of your noon meridian. That means that for you, it is after noon. So noon has already occurred. Your, your solar noon has already occurred. And this is just to do with uh, the way that our time zones are broken up. The time zones, of course, don't follow the motion of the sun or else we'd have probably 360 different time zones. <laughs> um, as the sun moves, we know that the sun, is, the apparent motion of the sun across our sky, the sun appears to rotate around the earth once a day. We know that what's actually happening is the earth is spinning on um, its axis once per day. So that means there's 360 degrees in that circle, in that um, rotation per day. So the earth spins 360 degrees uh, almost per day. So that means the sun actually travels. Well, the sun appears to travel, that's what I should say, across the sky or across um, the whole sky of the earth. 360 degrees in one day. This means that in one hour, the sun is going to travel 15 degrees across the sky. And in one minute, it will travel just a quarter of a degree across the sky. Because it moves, the sun moves 15 degrees per hour. So in 15 degrees across the sky um, in one hour. So in 30 minutes, the sun would move seven and a half degrees across the sky. So half of that 15. So the way that I figure this out um, is 360 degrees per day. If you divide that by 24 hours in a day, 360 divided by 24 is 15. So that's 15 degrees per hour. If you then divide your 15 degrees per hour by 60, you'll get um, 0.25 per minute. So we can use this to tell, uh, to determine the time in other locations. So for example, if it's solar noon on the prime meridian, that means that the sun is directly overhead of the prime meridian. So directly overhead of, or uh, in the highest position in the sky anyway, um, of the people in Greenwich, England and everyone along that uh, prime meridian. So if you are in the United States at 90 degrees west, what time would you be experiencing on your watch? The way to determine this is to look at the difference in latitude. So the difference is uh, 90 degrees. Oh, difference in longitude, sorry. Um, from zero to 90, our difference is 90 degrees. So there's a 90, de 90 degrees degree difference. So then you can find your offset from this solar noon. So solar noon at the prime meridian. Okay, so what time is that for us in the US at 90 degrees? We can find the difference. So it will take the sun six hours to travel 90 degrees. That's because the sun travels 15 degrees per hour. And 90 divided by 15 is 6, or 6 times 15 is 90. So in 6 hours, the sun will travel 90 degrees across the sky. So that means we are offset from our solar noon by 6 hours. So solar noon is occurring at the prime meridian, and we are offset from that by 6 hours. We know that because we're 90 degrees in longitude away from the prime meridian. So since we know that we are um, at 90 degrees west, we know that that means our clock is um, earlier in the day than the prime meridian. That's what I mean here, PM, prime meridian time. So we are located west, which means that our time is earlier than the prime meridian. So the prime meridian will ex be experiencing a later time in the day because that prime meridian is going to see the sun rise and set first before us. 
So we know that we are six hours offset from this solar noon, which means we are going to be uh, just waking up at six o'clock a.m. So six in the morning if we are located at 90 degrees west. So we find the difference in uh, longitude 90 to zero. The difference is 90 degrees. The time that that takes, so the time it would take for solar noon to, uh, the, the distance we are from solar noon, I should say, is six hours in time because we know it's going to take the sun six hours to travel from the prime meridian to directly above our heads. And since we're west of the prime meridian, we know that our time's going to be earlier in the day. The same way that um, you can think of it, the east coast has later time than us. We are located to the west. We, are, we always have uh, three hours earlier um, in terms of time than the east coast. So that's a good way to check and remember. So since we are west, we're going to be earlier. So it would be um, 6 a.m. for people at 90 degrees west if it was solar noon on the prime meridian. So that's all I have for you today. Um, I know I said it was a short one and I wasn't lying. Uh, your lab is on Canvas on the assignment button. So um, good luck with that. Please, please post questions in the discussion board or send me emails so that I can see them. We are, um, this is our first module, our first uh, transition to online, so we'll see how it goes. I have complete faith in you. That is not what I'm worried about. I'm hoping all my technological changes will have worked well. So you will need, uh, you will probably need a calculator for the lab. So I have enabled the Canvas calculator. So if you don't have one, um, Canvas allows me to give you access to a scientific calculator. So that should be, there's a little calculator button. Um, I think on your screen, it'll be on the right of each question. So you'll see the calculator. You'll be able to use it there. Um, good luck with the lab. Good luck with the homework. And I will see you either in office hours, on the discussion board, or virtually for the next lecture.